Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our second uh, webinar of the series 2020, um, a year without public space under COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Henrik Thieven. I'm working at Chinese University of Hong Kong and with Luisa Bravo from City Space Architecture, we launched this initiative. Our idea was to use a unique platform of the Journal of Public Space with its close link to UN Habitat to exchange experience about the role of public space under the pandemic. We invited a number of international colleagues and reached out uh, to the general public to gather and share a wide range of insights from different parts of the world. And uh, last uh, Thursday, we started with the first event, um, which addressed the question how we should reframe the role of public space through the experience of the pandemic. For this first session, we invited speakers from Seattle, New York, Cairo, and Quito, and also from UN Habitat. And uh, this uh, video of the first webinar will be posted today, and uh, so you can also follow the conversation. Uh, in parallel, we are producing at the moment an emergency issue for the Journal of Public Space, with papers reflecting on the current crisis and presenting first approaches to address it. We also launched an online survey to capture experience of public space under COVID-19. So we ask you all, uh, if you have time, uh, you can fill it out. Uh, you can find it on our website and also on our registration page. Um, before we start, just a very brief introduction of how you can engage with us. So you will see that <clears throat> we basically uh, disenabled the chat and video function for attendees. Uh, however, you can send us at any time questions via the question and answer function of Zoom. And uh, also we will have a post event survey where you can also raise questions. During the webinar, my colleagues Ying Fan Chen and uh, Stephanie Cheng, you can see them, um, they will basically go through all your questions and select some later for the roundtable discussion. And um, of course, we cannot answer all questions in this uh, session, uh, but what we will do, we will collect all those and also use for future sessions uh, in the coming months. So before we start, because maybe, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone uh, need to leave earlier, I also want to announce our next webinar on next Thursday, May 21st. Um, that one will focus on health disparity and public space and high density environments. And will bring together medical experts and urbanists from uh, Delhi, from Hong Kong and from New York. Okay, so far uh, for the introduction from my side. And I want to pass the word now to Luisa Bravo, my co-host, and uh, she will introduce mm -hmm. this webinar. Okay, Luisa. Uh, thank you, Hendrik, for the introduction and welcome everyone, speakers and attendees, to this uh, second webinar. This is going to be a very exciting uh, webinar. We received a lot of uh, responses and very positive feedbacks when we announced this webinar just a few days ago on uh, Facebook and our social media. Uh, so the webinar today is about uh, innovative approaches and creative practices in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As you probably noticed uh, in the main program of activities of our initiative, we will run this uh, uh, webinar on this same topic every second Thursday of the month. So uh, we are starting this month in May, which is a Syrian serious number one, but we will continue in June, July, and hopefully also in August. So the second Thursday of each month, we will have uh, this uh, topic, innovative approaches and creative practices in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm very happy to have um, uh, with us uh, uh, several speakers uh, very, with very interesting backgrounds. Actually, we are trying to have a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach for this kind of uh, webinar. So we have artists and art producers, uh, um, Jay Wall and Yena Young. I will introduce you uh, 
later. And we also have uh, a number of uh, speakers, academic scholars uh, from uh, uh, New Zealand. And it's impressive that, and uh, sorry, China. Uh, it's impressive that we have now people connected on for this webinar from Philadelphia, United States, uh, from Berlin, Germany, uh, myself uh, from Italy. Uh, also, uh, we have um, Hendrik from Hong Kong, Fen and uh, Stephanie from Hong Kong as well. Um, and uh, from New, uh, from Auckland, New Zealand, and someone uh, that was supposed to be in China, but actually is in Italy. <laughs> Uh, it's it's very nice to have this uh, very uh, you know rich panel of speakers and uh, geographical areas that we will uh, be covering during this webinar. Okay, so we start as you see from the program that is published online on our website. Uh, this uh, webinar is divided in two parts. The first one with the artists and art producers affiliated to in situ, the European platform for artistic creation in public space. And then the uh, second part with academic scholars uh, from uh, University of Auckland, uh, Nanjing University, and Auckland University of Technology. Okay, so we start with the first part with uh, Jay Wall from the Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts in Philadelphia and uh, Jena Young, Plastic Fantastique uh, in Berlin, Germany. I, I, as I previously mentioned, they are both affiliated to in situ, which is uh, the European platform for artistic creation in public space. Uh, it was established in 2003 and uh, it has already supported more than 250 artists uh, working in uh, art in public space and uh, in situ is uh, uh, brings together 20 partners from 12 countries and beyond uh, because we also have Jay that is not from Europe but from US. Um, uh, Jay is from the Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts which is a large performing arts venue in Philadelphia uh, and so you have the floor now Jay. Um, thank you and good morning everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Uh, if that worked, I'm going to say yes, it worked because everybody's smiling. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Hendrik, um, uh, and my colleagues. Uh, it's very early in the morning here, um, but it, it's such a pleasure. So I think, um, you know, this just speaks to how the awareness of public space uh, in the world is suddenly very acute. Um, the, the, the idea that we are part of something larger, the fact that we're connected uh, in space physically, uh, obviously because an awareness of our biological connections to each other with this virus is, is very special right now and very unusual. Um, the public have a sense of ownership of this public space in a new way, have a sense of contention, have a sense of fear, uh, have a sense of all these things. Uh, and and it really affects how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about each other, and, and the public space is really the place where all that happens. And I think that's always true, but it's a particularly special moment. Uh, and um, I'm offering for myself and for all of you some gratitude that we can be here together in this public space, this weird internet Zoom public space, uh, but a, a space for us to gather nonetheless, and gathering is a very special thing. Um, artists. Uh, always deal in this. You know, the artists really are our collective memory, our collective consciousness. Uh, artists really help us with understanding of what's happening. Um, and wherever there's an art project, it kind of only exists in a public space. So although I work in a performing arts venue, uh, primarily uh, where we're doing work inside theaters, you know, for the duration of that performance, it has to become a public space in order for a performance to exist. Uh, and so this understanding of how the arts and how public space are inherently linked and are inherently um, necessary for each other is sort of the place I'm starting from. Uh, Philadelphia, let's see, did that work? How do I change slides? Okay, hold on. There we go. Uh, Philadelphia, this is uh, Love Park, uh, a, a famous statue by Robert Diatta, which uh, graces our public spaces. Uh, we're really one of the nation's first really thinkers of public space 
for many, many reasons. Uh, the city's park, Fairmount Park, is the largest urban park in America. Uh, other public spaces that we sort of led the charge in, we are the first zoo in public, uh, we have the first zoo, we have the first hospital. Uh, we are uh, the first public utility of water built in 1815 in Philadelphia's uh, largest waterworks and quickly became a tourist attraction in this country. So the notion of parkland and uh, healthcare and utilities being part of the public space has been true historically in Philadelphia and the arts uh, are no less present. Uh, there's a program in the city called the Mural Arts Program, which is the nation's largest arts and public space program uh, in America. We are the home to over 4,000 murals which uh, when you kind of take together um, uh, the mural arts program likes to say forms the autobiography of our city and the way that communities come together uh, and kind of decide together how, uh, what we put on the wall, how we create a uh, space together. And as you walk through our city, you kind of see this scrapbook of ideas, of people, of energy. Uh, and we're very proud of that program. Uh, which is sort of a fundamental understanding of how art and public space in Philadelphia are deeply connected. Now, I mentioned I work uh, at the Kimmel Center. Uh, it's a performing art venue. That's our beautiful building there by Raphael Vignoli. Uh, we have other, uh, you can, well, depending on how your <laughs> street is set up, but we have other buildings further up the street there that make up, uh, we have 9,000 seats of uh, indoor venues. So uh, uh, between our organization and our eight resident companies, including Philadelphia Orchestra, Opera Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Ballet, and more, uh, we really serve a really broad and diverse community of artistic programming. Um, but we don't just work in those spaces, uh, we, we work in all sorts of spaces. So here's a project that, uh, for example, we did uh, where we hung uh, a band uh, at the waterfront and created a dance party in the summertime uh, for thousands of people who could come and, and, and the band <laughs> flew in the air above them and we changed the relationship of performance through public space in these bold and unusual ways, which is of course what artists um, always do for us. Um, so I'm a member of in situ, I'm very proud and I, um, I feel honored to be able to speak for them. They're some of the smartest and most engaged people I've ever met and I learn from them every day. Uh, we are a large network, a consortium of people who produce work in public space. Uh, as Luisa said, we represent uh, 12 countries um, across Europe. Uh, I'm the only non-European member, and then we have an associated uh, project in Sri Lanka where residencies happen. Uh, really what we do is we invite artists to think about how they can engage with the public space, um, the, socio, the social, the political, the economic, of course, health and environmental impacts of public space or things that artists take on uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and I'm gonna just very quickly in my time here, just quickly give you some examples of projects we're doing during the virus. Um, uh, please check us out uh, more. Um, and uh, I'm just, I'm really grateful to Institute for allowing me to be part of this and learn from them. Here's just a map of where we exist. You can see me at the bottom there, the only US member. Uh, and I really learned so much from European uh, artists who have really been on the forefront of thinking about performance in public space and what I'll call time-based art for a very long time. Uh, of course, we all know that there are sculptures sometimes in public space, uh, like the one I showed earlier by uh, Robert Indiana, uh, that we walk by and kind of become part of the architecture of the city. But the kind of work that Institute does is really interventions, where we um, quite literally perform what we call acupuncture on the city through artistic practice and really enhance our understanding and our opportunities to have these interruptive gifts in our communities by artists. So uh, a project, uh, one of the a funding, fundamental project that has happened by uh, many of the Institute partners across Europe and with me, here's a picture of the project I did in Philadelphia, uh, is a work by Olivier Grossetet, who's an artist from Marseille, where we invite the public to quite literally construct the city. So in this project, I had a thousand Philadelphians uh, build this 10 story tower in an act of architecture in performance. Uh, and then also an act of revolution because it was only up for 24 hours and then we tore it down kind of reminding us that as citizens, we are responsible for building the city and we have the ability to change it. Um, that's an in-situ project, just to give you examples of the kind of work uh, the network is capable of doing. This is a dance company called uh, Asphalt Peloton from Berlin. The project is Tape Riot. And this is where through tape and sound and bodies, they create a new urban landscape on top of the existing urban landscape. And you can see the way the tape there creates a new space uh, for the dancers uh, to interact with. Uh, and this woman is just sort of walking by it. It's kind of lovely. 
um, the way that this dance kind of moved through the space. And what would happen is the dancers would lead the public on a journey through the city and leaving these tape residue behind where you'd look back and see the way that layers of memory and movement and architectural understanding can um, change by what happens there. Uh, a beautiful project uh, that we're really proud of. But now, um, of course, we're uh, dealing with something new. Uh, of course, one of the first things that Philadelphia did was put up murals because we have an understanding that <laughs> public space and messaging and art is fundamental, that these things are not, this is oxygen, it's non-negotiable is who we are. And so this is a muralist uh, by Niles Livingston who immediately put up a message to, as a as sort of a public service announcement and, and in front of it, you notice a hand washing station. So it was active as well. Um, the, this virus represents a hardship for artists so much. I don't want to uh, not mention the difficulty that artists are in. They don't, under normal circumstances, they have unsteady income. And in America, they often don't have access to health insurance. This has only made that harder. Uh, and the work that artists are doing in, in the face of this to still bring us together, to still help us understand who we are and who we could be, is an extraordinary act of bravery and generosity. And I am uh, in awe of the artists who are continuing to find ways to work uh, without any kind of security for themselves, which is always true, but more true now. Um, art forms are changing uh, through this uh, process, as you can imagine. I know some of my colleagues will talk about the way that technology and, and um, people who are non-artists are engaging in practices. Um, but this heightened awareness of public space uh, that I think the virus is giving us is creating an opportunity for artists. Um, and artists have at least fundamentally a desire to help, a desire to make change, and a desire to bring people together. And so um, who better than to lead the way in healing for all of us than the arts community? Uh, so, um, you know, immediately we didn't have audiences. So the, the orchestra, you know, came and performed for nobody and we would stream that on the web, which is a sort of a, a platform that's growing more and more as we think about how the internet can be a way to create performance. But, um, you know, that's only a sort of step that takes a traditional art form and starts to figure out ways to broaden its public space reach. Um, I just did a project I called Music for Moms where we invited artists to write personal songs to mothers for Mother's Day and we could do these sort of singing telegrams and artists could continue to compose and bring their families together through the emotion of music. And so we had artists create little videos that we sent to personal audiences of a family. So rather than performing for a whole auditorium, we started narrowing our audience to families. So one of the ways that the virus is affecting artistic practice is it's changing the scope of audience and the definition of who the audience is and in what ways they gather. Uh, of this, this beautiful project by um, some street artists in Philadelphia called the Vote by Mail Philadelphia Poster Project is a reminder that we have responsive, civic responsibilities and artists are really carrying that message here in our city, not just the mural I showed you earlier about washing your hands, but also that we still have an, uh, an obligation to uphold democracy and to vote. And of course, if people can't go to their voting places, I'm very lucky to live in a city where voting by mail is possible. That isn't true across America. But artists have taken up the charge to get people to vote. Uh, and you know, they, they don't earn anything from this. They just think it's important. Uh, and so these are posters that you can download uh, or there's some distribution places that you can go and get this work by artists and put it into, onto your house as a way um, that artists are dealing with this. Uh, check that out at Vote by Mail, the hashtag that I show you there. It's, it's a pretty cool project. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna give you some in situ projects because I'm running out of time. So quickly, this is a piece in, in, in Graz uh, by La Strada, which is an organization in, um, in Austria. And Joanne Layton is a choreographer and installation artist created this uh, watchtower sort of uh, where people uh, citizens are asked to hold vigil over the city and every sunrise and every sunset a citizen is looking out over the city and you're aware of someone watching for you protecting you and wherever you are in the city um, you kind of know that there's someone there thinking about you and it, what it does is it creates this envelope around the city of protection of public space and awareness even if you can't see it even it, you know you can't verify it but you kind of understand it's there and as the city goes on and more and more people are responsible for holding this vigil um, you start to be connected to each other and it in unusual ways. Um, one of the artists has now said, you know, that if people want to hold this vigil from their homes in times of the virus where they really aren't able to travel, you can kind of do this from your window. And it reconnects the sort of intimate space with the public space in a way that we're, we're holding watch for each other. Kind of a beautiful idea. Um, uh, there's a Radio Local, is a project by some British artists that is happening right now with the Norwich and Norfolk Festival. 
which is a partner of ours. Uh, check out them out at this website. But every day they're doing a hyper, hyper local radio program where they're really talking about the weather on the street corner. What are you wearing? Who are you dating? Who are you talking to? And through Zoom and interviewing ways, they're taking a radio program, which is usually a device to really spread general news to a large public, and they're really narrowing it down to a block or a neighborhood and thinking differently around how radio can be a tool to communicate. But they're not a news program, it's a performance piece, and these are, uh, they're very funny and engaging, and it's just rethinking about how the active energy of comedy and performance can connect us uh, in, in very small, hyper-local ways. Uh, in Copenhagen, our partner Metropolis has invited 100 artists to lead 100 curated walks over 100 days. Uh, again, the public space is somewhat forbidden right now, and so the, inviting an artist to go venture out into the space and encountering what's there or what's not there in this case uh, is pretty powerful. And what happens is these artists kind of go from wherever they live and they start on this journey, and every hour, kind of like a church bell, the artist will check in to a Facebook Live event about where they are and kind of report in whatever way that artist would report, whether they're speaking or there's music or there's movement or there's poetry in, in all the ways that artists do that. And then people from their home are aware that this artist who kind of becomes a representative for them being able to take these forbidden walks through space. And then you can go through and watch them and it helps you reframe your, your space and how you might walk through it. Again, artists giving your body new power through public space in times that you cannot. Uh, a project uh, from Budapest, uh, uh, Transforming Associations, the company. This is really unusual. For a few years, they've been developing this project with in situ called Apocalypse Training, where in sort of a tongue-in-cheek way, they've been creating this game performance project in public space, where together we might train for the coming apocalypse. Uh, of course, we're kind of in an apocalypse, uh, and this is suddenly this idea which seemed a uh, sort of fun and humorous way to bring us together and think about how we're connected uh, it became very real. And actually the photo on the bottom in the very middle is me. <laughs> um, and we were doing a, an exercise where we were trying out this project in Italy uh, six months ago, um, where we were helping the artists kind of do an experiment in public space where we were training for the apocalypse and getting people to ask us questions about what we were doing. Well, now this picture actually looks like photojournalism. It looks like something that actually happened in Italy. And so our relationship to the actions that have happened in public space have changed through this event. Uh, so what these artists are now doing is taking this apocalypse training idea and trying to find a way to adapt it through their phones so that people can continue to train through this artistic project with an awareness of very real circumstances. Uh, it's very moving and actually looking at this picture kind of disturbs me because at the time we were participating in a very fun artistic project and now I look back and I'm, I'm sort of heartbroken by what's happened in, in that part of Italy. Um, a project from another British artist, Collider, led by Seth Honor, is this idea of robot selfies, where although we can't be in public space, these robots that are sort of XY plotters might be able to draw um, portraits of us into public space. Uh, these are just concept drawings, but these robots kind of already exist. You can attach them to walls. So the idea is, could you upload a photo of yourself and have robots in public space and draw that picture to put you where you can't currently be? And then as the space slowly starts to open up and people are able to walk by, they start to see this sort of history, uh, this, this memory of people who have been in public space. Uh, this is gonna happen in the summer, we hope in Milan uh, and with some other partners, the Norwich and Norfolk Festival has also been supportive of this. Um, and these are examples. Jay, your, your time is, I think. Uh, um, this is my last slide. Uh, just, uh, uh, these are just examples, new forms are changing. I just was trying to give you an overview. Um, and then of course this is, what's happening in Philadelphia and across America as people are putting rainbows on their homes as a way, again, to re-engage art and public space. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I got it all in, but I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> thank you, Jay. I saw your passion and enthusiasm in presenting so many activities, projects, initiatives, very creative. And actually you provided a very nice overview, not just related to what's happening right now in Philadelphia, but also uh, in Europe, also other and other art projects uh, affiliated to in situ. Uh, thank you because it was very informative. Um, okay, so now we move to Yena Young from uh, Plastic Fantastic. Uh, that is uh, an art collective uh, based in Berlin, Germany. Uh, I don't know if you know Plastic Fantastic, but uh, they are uh, very active and promoting a very 
um, interesting uh, projects uh, and they also have two running projects uh, iSphere and uh, PSS for doctors if, uh, if I'm not wrong I don't know if you will talk about this uh, today but uh, the floor is yours so thanks a lot for inviting us um, I would quickly introduce um, what we do so we are an art collective uh, sampling performative possibilities in urban environment. And we borrowed the public space, like, uh, finding the neglected corner in the city and involve the citizens into the creative process. We use air and plastic as our working medium and the transparent, very thin uh, plastic sheet layer connects and disconnects at the same time. And it creates a social interaction. You think that you are inside, but actually you are in public space outside. Um, and what we do is very soft, uh, physically and also emotionally. And softness is also our urban approach that it doesn't disturb what is there already but it's softly touching the existing environment. It is playful and creates a friction that also emotional friction that on the way to your work or home, you suddenly find this alien object. And after a few days, it's just gone and showing the empty space. And, but this empty space shows the possibilities to use it in your public area. It is very light, so we can easily transport with us and it's easy to set up and dismantle. Um, this was in a Venice Art Biennale last year that we did with uh, Stelius Coes as an art director and Fabio Viale as a sculptor. We do multidisciplinary cooperation with other artists like musicians, performers, choreographer. And this uh, occasion, we had a cooperation with a sculptor who sculpted a marble looking like a wooden bricole in Venice. And we squeezed our structure through this sculpture, creating imaginary Venice, which had no wall, nor ceiling, nor floor. And while the visitors or audience are passing through this structure, they become performers, just simply walking through and you complete the art piece. So this kind of work we have been doing so far and since the coronavirus came out, we, all our project was full stop mostly canceled or delayed and we had a uh, suddenly so much time to do nothing and doing nothing actually helps to be creative and we saw on the news that the doctors were lacking masks or personal protective equipment and we were thinking what can we do to help somehow our society and doing something that we can actually do quite well and we were thinking you know what, what we are creating, the structure has overpressure, positive air pressure, which means ventilators uh, is flowing, giving air constantly. So the air is coming in and excessive air goes out through these little holes, through zipper or uh, little uh, sewing holes. And this positive air pressure is opposite of negative air pressure room in hospitals which normally patients with virus are um, in. And we thought, then why not put doctors, not patients inside, then create a protective space for them. And the air is uh, supplied from a clean area, uh, for example, outside. And we've been exploring this idea. So the corona became our new subject in our work our uh, self-initiated projects. And we explored this idea to more artistic and we made an application for an 
open call for our projects where we thought about hypothetical story that you cannot stay home anymore. You have to stay out because the air indoor is contaminated. It's a hypothetical story. And then you have to live in the street, on the street, in the bubble. And when you are getting out of bubble, you have to wear a, a sphere. We call it eye sphere. And initially, we were thinking to have a snorkel on top so that you can get air from above. But while we were developing, the new regulation in Berlin came that you have to cover your nose and mouth in public transport. And we thought, OK, let's uh, make a performance one day before the regulation came into effect. Um, it's an art performance, but also informative showing people or letting people that you have to cover your nose and mouth. And we share the tutorial online, which I think a lot of people took it really seriously. And then with this tutorial, audience becomes performer or an artist again. So we shared our cooking recipe as a profi chef. And we got a lot of uh, feedbacks and comments, um, much more than we thought of. Oh. So that was a very easy tutorial that you can easily follow. But now the, this uh, hemisphere transparent one is uh, sold out. I don't know, uh, many, many people bought it, I guess. And you can pimp your eye sphere with the many variations according to your needs. If you're living in a warm country, so you can put a shade or sun, sunglasses, and you can put the ventilator or filters to make a really um, practical eye sphere. But as I said, we started as an art project. It didn't meant to be a tech design product, but it can be developed further. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, very nice. Uh, I have to mention that uh, uh, at the Journal of Public Space, we published an article back in 2018 regarding the work of uh, Plastic Fantastic. So the previous uh, projects that you showed, uh, are um, most of them are included uh, in, uh, in this article that you published with us at the Journal of Public Space. So if anyone is interested, right. then maybe they could go on your website, which is very rich and beautiful, but also on our website at the Journal of Public Space. Uh, okay, so um, good. Uh, I think that, that uh, you both uh, already answered to the first question that we included here for the discussion. Are you rethinking your art practice during the pandemic? Um, in different ways. You, I think you both answered with your presentations. So maybe you could say something regarding the two other questions that we have included, how the pandemic will affect your work in the future. Um, and the other one, did you find any source of inspiration from common people's creative responses during the pandemic? I think we have, let's say, ten, five, ten minutes to answer. Uh, Yena, do you want to start? <laughs> uh, I can start. Okay. Um, so that these three questions together, I can answer like, um, so public space we cannot use at the moment. Then place has changed, like an uh, online exhibition, a lot of people are doing an Instagram or um, imaginary uh, another place we can use. and. Uh, we started conversation with the CTM festival, Club de Transmediale, um, that if this situation goes further to next year, then their festival next year needs something, such as uh, several bubbles where you can limit amount of people in one bubble for each event. For example, this could change the whole constellation, how we work. And we were actually lucky to open an exhibition. It's going on now in Seoul. Seoul. Uh, it's an indoor uh, gallery exhibition that 
we supposed to go there and set up our installation, but then it was not possible. And we did a remote setup giving our, our tutorial, which we never did before, but it worked perfect. They were professional, they did it better than us. And now the gallery is controlling the visitors. So the visitors should book, they make a reservation and book the time slot when they can come. And I saw the review that actually people liked it because uh, the visitors are controlled. The space is free uh, and you don't need to bump into the other people. You can really enjoy and explore the exhibition. Um, and I think our future projects or requests will probably regard the subject of Corona, this pandemic issues, mm -hmm. both physically and emotionally. Um, I mean, physically wearing mask or inventing a new mask uh, way of a fashionable item could be also a solution, but the emotionally like a Corona blue, how to um, get over or how to get more social interaction would be our new subject. And Jay? <laughs> um, well, I was just thinking, you know, we want to know how this will change what we do. It's like, we're all in, in the middle of a very traumatic experience. And I don't, I don't know that I understand my own personal trauma at the moment because I'm in the middle of it. And I feel like that's true for all of us in an unusual way. Um, suddenly arts organizations like mine are being asked to, to take care of people in a new way. You know, we're responsible for people's health, like physically, not just their emotional well-being. Uh, now that, that's an interesting question. What are the physical um, connections to people? You know, there's a lot of things online and I'm getting asked all the time because I know a lot of musicians who are putting out concerts, people are trying to figure out um, how to gain audiences, how to earn money. Uh, and there's an overabundance. And I know right now, because I'm in a traumatic situation, it's very difficult for me to focus. You know, I don't, it's not, I have such an opportunity to watch so many things online of so many amazing, talented people. And yet I really need to have some quiet time. So I think one of the things that we're all struggling with is how do we use public space, which is a place for reflection often, a place for togetherness, a place for awareness, a place for gratitude. How do the arts continue to serve those needs uh, that we have? And um, do we need to do that physically? Uh, and, and what ways does the physical trigger our emotional well-being? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we're asking in ways that we haven't had to ask uh, uh, in the same, obviously, it's just different. Um, but I don't know that, that we're limited to the virtual space. I think the uh, internet, and this call is an example, offers us such unusual and special connections, but we're not limited to that. You know, old mediums like the radio, like I showed you one project, they'll still work the way that we connect uh, through our voices. You know, I imagine theaters uh, will come up with new forms where actors might call you on the phone and deliver you a monologue just for you, the way that we did uh, music for moms. Or I imagine you could do, um, uh, a parade of musicians down the street and everybody could open their windows and listen to the music where people are at home having a concert. I think all the, the forms that we normally find very special in terms of storytelling, in terms of sound, um, those are still the, the tools we have uh, that are very crucial to the human experience. And what we just have to do uh, that artists are always doing in public space is figuring out what's really there and how do they use that to a way that brings people together. Um, I don't know that, um, you know, whether we're projecting our pictures into public space through a robot, which is a really interesting thing. And actually, when I think back on the days where we all just walked down the sidewalk, not looking at each other, just looking at our phones, um, we were essentially projecting ourselves into space with a robot. And so what this artist is suggesting is another way to think about our own behavior, which is, of course, what artists do, uh, and they do it so beautifully. Um, I don't know how this will ultimately affect it, certainly um, here in America. The financial situation is going to be quite um, challenging for the continued pr uh, production of arts. Um, we don't have a real public support for that in the same ways that you see in Europe. And we're always trying to find models to make that happen. Uh, but I think that sometimes breeds opportunity for creativity. Um, I think what Yena is doing in Plastic Fantastic is so interesting and so smart. Um, the way that they're creating tools that allow us to connect and see each other and be together uh, and, and just understand where those barriers lie and, and make us again aware of what's public and what's private and how, you, how do you challenge those needs uh, uh, with material and space. So 
I, I don't know that I have an easy answer. Everybody really wants to know, like, what, what are artists making? And the truth is that we're all, we're all working through this together, and I'm, I'm proud to be part of that community. Um, and I look forward to hearing for what my colleagues are going to say, because I think I'm learning every day from the artists. You know, one of your questions was, how are we learning from common people? Well, you know, I'm on calls with my family and I'm watching my niece and nephew show me pictures of things that are important to them online. And I'm trying to realize how people are making art at home and is artistic practice fundamentally to our family, family lives. You know, as, as mothers are, and fathers are now teaching their kids at home because kids can't go to school, they're using the arts as an engagement tool for education and for, uh, for celebration. And so um, at the Kimmel Center, we started a project, a hashtag called Art Happens at Home to remind people that we're not limited to the work of artists in performance spaces or artists in museums. We have the ability to create meaningful artistic engagement with our, with our own families, our children, and ourselves. Um, and so art happens at home. It changes what the nature of public space can be because we can make work at home privately and share it in a new way. Um, and just to remember the ways in which we can be connected, I think gives me real hope the way that artistic practice will continue to develop and continue to respond uh, to this virus. Do you want to say something more, Yana? Well, what's the hashtag again? Art happens at home? Is it interesting? Art happens <laughs> at home. <laughs> okay, I will search for that. Yes, we saw that actually those uh, creative approach as a response to the to the current situation, which is a health crisis, but uh, soon becoming also an economic crisis, uh, has been uh, you know reinterpreted somehow by common people, uh, starting from artists, but also what it is very interesting it is that uh, common people are using. Uh, creative productions uh, as a reaction uh, to this uh, global uh, emergency, global crisis, uh, and they are somehow proudly producing uh, their own work and showing what they are producing uh, proudly on, uh, on the web and uh, with the live performances that other people understood as very creative and started to film, to record, and then to share themselves uh, so it's a kind of, uh, you know, global creation, uh, in kind of uh, creative or artistic, uh, um, you know, response uh, to this emergency, which actually we also had in Italy, you know, with the um, people on the balconies uh, playing music uh, or uh, talking each other from uh, different windows. Uh, and just hanging out uh, from the window and uh, looking at the other people because uh, this is how public space works. Uh, you, be, you are in the public space and you watch other people <laughs> doing other stuff. <laughs> and uh, so you enjoy yourself even by just watching uh, without even you know, performing something or doing something in, in public space. Um, so this was the last uh, question, actually, uh, the, the, the creation of uh, common people uh, as a response to the pandemic. Uh, that is also an introduction to the second part of the webinar. Um, uh, this second part is chaired by Manfredo Manfredini from uh, uh, University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, so Manfredo is uh, an expert in comparative urbanism and architecture and also urban informatics. Uh, Manfredo, do you want to introduce also other speakers in your session? Sure, oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Hendrik, for organizing these and inviting us. Uh, well, uh, how to introduce it? I think that when, uh, when Louisa, we started talking about the possibility of having a webinar, on uh, this particular subject, which is uh, creativity, diffuse creativity. And uh, we try, we're try. trying to look at uh, how we can tackle that. Uh, well, the first thing that I thought living in New Zealand, I've been here for 10 years now, I'm Italian, as you can tell from my name. Uh, and uh, uh, the first thing that came to our mind was uh, to try to understand how this, uh, say, phenomenon of mobility, translocalism, would actually be important to be understood also in this particular moment in which uh, the mobility exactly is fundamentally constrained. And so what we did we was inviting different people, different experts, uh, starting from Franco. Franco is expert in the post-colonialism. And uh, uh, Kirsten, who works with him, and uh, unfortunately this night, tonight cannot be with us, or tonight because it's night, it's uh, uh, almost 12 o'clock here, 
at night here in New Zealand. Uh, and they work together. Uh, uh, and she is expert in children and uh, children rights. So that's another very interesting point because uh, again, children find uh, a particular difficulty in coping with this uh, uh, you know, lockdown that we are facing and uh, becomes very uh, complicated the thing to, to manage. And, uh, and then eventually uh, I thought of, an, of talking of, of uh, ex experiment exploring uh, a different area, which is a, a sort of speculation on that. And then I'm, uh, Andrea with his uh, approach to uh, exactly this uh, everyday art uh, from the uh, perspective of say aesthetics uh, and then myself and myself uh, as uh, uh, Luisa uh, just uh, told I'm uh, uh, particularly interested in uh, looking at what is uh, what are the major uh, things that uh, are changing are changing our experience our everyday life uh, and particularly the issue of uh, new technologies so without further doing I would start with my presentation uh, am, I, am, I, am I allowed to do so? Sure. So, there we go. So, what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm uh, presenting here is uh, an extension of research that I've been doing for a few years uh, here in Oakland uh, on uh, what is happening uh, uh, around uh, the problem of consumption. So, uh, New Zealand has uh, probably relatively recently, in particular Australia and also North America in general, uh, have a, a common form of urbanism that uh, is mainly dominated by large development uh, at low density. And the question, as uh, Victor Grew and uh, firstly probably tried to address, uh, uh, is exactly how we do a, work a workable public space. And how do we manage it uh, in a situation like this one? That's the point. Uh, uh, that we are seeing now when so many changes has happened, have happened that possibly are going to are transforming quite radically the way in which uh, we live and conceive these spaces uh, uh, in the transition that we have, uh, both in terms of, uh, as we're saying, social changes, but also technology. So uh, I'm presenting a short research that expands on uh, how what we call uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> distributed and participatory creativity, which is essentially what we understand as form of, uh, I can say, an effect of the Internet 2.0, so essentially the possibility of uh, being somehow prosumer, as John Ritzer would say, at the same time, how that uh, has to do with uh, a huge uh, dramatic change we have in these central places of our cities, uh, and, and, and getting there in a second, uh, uh, to explain in detail what they are, uh, that are going to be somehow cannibalized uh, by themselves. I'm talking about shopping malls. And that are in our city, in these low density cities, and you know, I mentioned grew and before, uh, the real centers of uh, the every, I can say, social, real social interactions, which we call us, uh, uh, found out. Yeah. So, what is, what is happening in New Zealand? Uh, probably is quite important to look at preliminarily what, uh, how we address that. And uh, the government immediately started uh, to set up a framework uh, with drawing upon the experience uh, in, uh, in. And that immediately brought us uh, to a lockdown. So this lockdown is the one in blue. Uh, started very early, as you can see, when we had a very low number of people that were in, uh, and indeed the government uh, got a lot of critiques because, as you can imagine, uh, that's uh, of course what uh, what happened is that we were able, in this particular way, uh, to limit uh, uh, the number of. Uh, uh, situation that we've seen in many countries in which uh, the health system is completely overwhelmed. And so we went out. Now we have we a have few, few days, we have with zero cases in the country. Now, a very strange thing that happened is uh, who actually was and If you look at that, we have a strange situation. Last week, uh, uh, we've heard of the situation uh, from CETA, CETA law, the situation of uh, uh, New York and uh, in general, uh, uh, the social disparity. Creating problems with the spread of the virus. But look at the data in New Zealand, and then you see something quite strange because what you see is that uh, 
let's say the, mo the, the most fortunate uh, group, I'm looking now at technicity, so those are it's the simple data, but, but there's plenty of indicators in this direction. There's, as you can see that 71% of people infected are the, the, the European people of the European descent. Uh, keep in mind that uh, in Oakland, uh, uh, the Europeans are about 50%. And uh, the, the salary, the weekly salary, that's you probably what I'm talking about. The thing about the people infected is that they see uh, most of them, so 23%, are actually people, young adults, so from 20 to, uh, to 30 years. So quite young, so very different than uh, in other cases. Again, uh, the spread was concentrated in the only, say, urban uh, area that we have in New Zealand, which is Oakland, where we are. We, uh, they have uh, the 36 percent of the cases altogether, so the three there are actually urban area uh, divided through. What is happening uh, in this urban area where we have uh, these uh, European, uh, young, uh, and urban people? Well, as I told you before, they live in uh, in a city in which just the very core has, uh, a, how can I say, uh, European density. Uh, but actually, most of it has a density which is probably lower than 3,000 people. What is happening there? That's an example. So, this is a, a shopping mall, and this is the Oakland plan. The Oakland plan that looks at the future of Oakland uh, in the next 40 years. So, actually, up, it was done in 2010. And what you can see in the middle image, so here, I don't know if you see the point, uh, uh, what, but what you can see here is uh, that the designation of the urban uh, metropolitan area is actually the pure area of the shopping mall, which is the one here. So that's quite worrying. Why is it worrying? Is it worrying because, uh, uh, well, people tend to recognize these places in a very different way as uh, they were in the past, and particularly because also of these centers are developing. And indeed, uh, the mall that I showed you before is called Sylvia Park, is not really a traditional shopping mall. Actually, you should change the name because Shopping is now not probably the main characteristics. Amazon and, uh, and whatever are actually growing this now with these uh, pandemics in an exp exponential way. And this is the difference between the old mall and the new mall. And, I, I, and the reason why I'm showing these two is because, uh, well, what I call the new one, I call post consumerism. Post consumer, not in the sense that we're not consuming, but in the sense that our consumption, as uh, Joseph Ritz uh, mentioned before, said, is becoming partially production. And what when we consume in, a, consume in a way, we also produce, or we are prosumer that sometimes produce and sometimes. So in this particular way, these particular users were particularly affected are the ones that are actually the most uh, active uh, on uh, social media. And what is happening is that uh, my study, in my studies, I tend to use Instagram. Why Instagram? Well, simply because the fact that it's based on visual elements. And this being based on visual elements allows us to understand a bit more about the perception of the presentation of the city. So the image of the city becomes quite and crucially represented in these places, but probably even more importantly is the way in which people relate to the other, to other people, and create networks that are incredibly extended and incredibly active. So as you see here, during pandemics, Instagram, which is potentially uh, something that should not really grow because it's based on experience, uh, and on places with people locked in, yes, of course, you can uh, put your images or when you do gym or you prepare your food, but in reality, uh, it, it, it lacks uh, uh, what feeds uh, uh, its activity. So in reality, it, it has increased. And that was quite strange. We were wondering why becoming the second uh, social media and uh, Facebook declining continuously. Again, is that uh, uh, the users of Instagram are again the same people, the same people that were affected. So we are now looking at a particular controversial situation in which the ones that were affected are the ones that could be or are more active. So what we have done here was looking at what was happening in, during the lockdown on these particular platforms. What you see in the first image is a, a comparison of the interaction that we found in this particular place. So George. In terms of interaction, we took the most important node of that center and we found something which was unexpected. So the interaction in a place which is completely locked, Hendrik, a place which is completely locked is actually increasing. What that means 
It means actually that uh, there's something else happening and actually is a form of polarization. So the network that are existing continue operating in a place which is completely closed uh, and there's only a What is more, even more important is the fact that they are specifically place-based. And this specific space-based and situated the form of representation that always rethink and reestablish that particular place of place engagement, that's why that particular node is what is probably our most important finding. Indeed, when we compare to the other type of mode, when I showed you the old style, the closed one, what you see is that the other one is totally dying, is actually that particular form, as we were saying at the beginning, of creative distractions. Uh, that is actually happening on the everyday. That's our reflection. I want to go further. I, want, I won't go further now, but uh, I will possibly talk in the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. And having said this now, I will introduce Franco, Franco Manai, who is, as I mentioned before, expert in uh, post-colonialism and cultural studies. So his uh, work uh, in this particular period uh, looks at, uh, as we said before, uh, grassroots uh, diffuse production of uh, micro creative moments. So Franco, if you are ready, please, uh, uh, I give you the floor. Um, Manfredo, you need to stop sharing your presentation. Yeah. Manfredo, your uh, Ma yeah. yeah. Now, Manfredo, so I can now share my screen. How's that? Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um. Uh, uh, and I'm uh, for many years have been a lecturer at the University of Auckland in cultural studies and post colonial literature. Then uh, my colleague Kirsten Anna is a lecturer in uh, criminology and publishes on children and in public space in public policy. Uh, we are extremely interested in studying the popular response to the lockdown measures imposed by the New Zealand government in order to avoid the spread of uh, COVID-19. In particular for this uh, webinar, um, webinar of scholars of public space, we will uh, talk about the use of public space by ordinary people attempting attempting to communicate not so much with the global audience but rather with their neighbors while they were being asked to stay home and avoid contact with people beyond their households. Um, Manfredo Manfredini, uh, Professor Manfredini, has just uh, analyzed some of the forms and content of people's attempts to communicate in virtual public spaces, i.e. through social media. For our study, um, we, I think we, we will mention the huge increase in uh, memberships uh, of an online platform called Neighborly. Uh, and uh, this platform has uh, known a very large uh, increase, uh, as I said, during the national lockdown. Um, this platform, Neighborly, was launched in 2014 with the main aim uh, of helping people connect with their neighbors online, naturally, uh, but uh, with the hope that online interactions might lead to face-to-face uh, -face interactions and the building of strong connected communities. Uh, having said that, uh, we, uh, we won't uh, talk in detail about neighborly because we would like to focus on other ways New Zealanders have attempted to connect and communicate, namely through the written messages, drawings, and a small installation, as it were, that appeared during the lockdown on the, on the fences, windows, and sidewalks around uh, uh, the um, 
the dwellings in Auckland's uh, low density suburban neighborhoods. In fact, um, uh, uh, low density housing is the norm in much of the city of around uh, 1.6 million inhabitants, where many families live in single or two storied homes surrounded by a garden. During lockdown, uh, people were allowed to walk or ride their bicycles in the vicinity of their homes, either by themselves or with members of their households, dogs included. Thus, the, the forms of personal expression and creativity that we will discuss in this presentation were intended uh, for neighbors walking or cycling past so they can be seen as a laudable effort to establish some kind of connection and communication with what could be a community of people living in the same area. For convenience, in our presentation, we could distinguish two types of uh, signs. Uh, first, uh, there are those uh, aimed mainly at entertaining passersby, especially helpful for parents whose children needed some sort of uh, excitement and motivation for what uh, might otherwise be a boring walk. Second, uh, there are those signs which actually say something, uh, convey some sort of individual thought or message which is offered to the potential community of neighbors. In the first category, we include all those uh, signs involving generic riddles and jokes, and those signs belonging to the teddy bear hunt. Uh, this uh, teddy bear hunt was inspired uh, by the books of Michael Rosen. This is an initiative that was launched very early on in an effort to keep uh, New Zealand's youngest citizens amused. People were encouraged to put their teddy bears in windows or anywhere that could be seen from the street. So children could go uh, hunting for them as they took exercise in their neighborhood. They were digital maps uh, also showing the location of all the teddy bears to guide the hunt. In the second category, uh, we include uh, those signs repeating in one form or another, the government motto, stay home, save lives. And uh, uh, the Anzac Day maxim, lest we forget. Um, I'll just uh, clarify what Anzac Day is. Um, in, in New Zealand and Australia, Anzac Day is the day on which uh, the nation uh, commemorates those who were killed uh, in, uh, um, in war and honors those who returned and served today. Um, the symbol of Anzac Day is the red poppy. However, these two types of signs uh, uh, often appear together on the same fence, in the same window or in the same sidewalk. So we will consider them all as the manifestation of a will to use the public spaces surrounding people's homes and private spaces open to public view um, in an attempt to establish and develop a sense of community. Um, Let's start with this uh, banner found on a fence in Avondale, Auckland. Um, this photo was taken on a Saturday morning in the third week of the level four lockdown, uh, maximum uh, level for uh, emergency, uh, and was taken on a major thoroughfare, now mainly frequented by the odd uh, pedestrian. It is clearly not a professionally made sign. It looks like the work of mom and dad and maybe their children. It's made uh, from an old uh, bed sheet, the letters painted uh, using a stencil. Maybe they didn't have an M stencil, but they improvised with an upside down W. The three words, please stay home, are presented against different colored backgrounds, purple, pink, black. The imagery includes hearts conveying the message that the words are given with love for the reader and that they are expected to be received with love. 
the sun is draped with a string of hibiscus flowers, which are associated uh, with Pacific Island uh, cultures. Finally, there is the emblem uh, for the Warriors Rugby League team, and this is uh, New Zealand after all. And um, anyway, one of the government mottos during the level four lockdown was stay home and save lives. This banner is a variant of that motto, but this time not as a directive with an explanation from the country's leaders, but as a plea from its citizens demonstrating they had uh, uh, internalized and support uh, the government's message. You can also see the teddy bear and further, further along the fence, uh, we find uh, a poppy, uh, the symbol of Anzac Day, as well as uh, the silver fern flag, a symbol of New Zealand, and the Samoan flag. So uh, this particular fence uh, in Avondale, in this uh, suburban neighborhood, th this could be taken as a typical example of many others in the same neighborhood and in the city's other uh, suburbs. The discourse, as we said, is a laudable attempt to use public space as a place where a community could communicate. Uh, uh, we could uh, uh, maybe discuss of uh, what kind of uh, real communication uh, this is, but uh, I think uh, I think that uh, that is uh, enough, and it's a laudable effort uh, that uh, they made to somehow try to connect with their neighbors. Um, um, here we have uh, uh, another example of the Anzac Day rhetoric and the teddy bear hunt. Uh, the poppies look like uh, they are ceramic, beautifully handcrafted, and these are signed by two girls and their mom. Uh, we have uh, 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 the, the names of the girls have been removed because we do not have their permission to show them. Um, Franco, time is almost up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, one, one, uh, you know, basically, I have. Uh, uh, I just wanted to show you other uh, examples of this uh, um, uh, creativity of the creativity uh, of uh, ordinary people trying to do uh, something uh, in this uh, period of lockdown. Uh, you can see there are uh, some some people have uh, put on their fences. Uh, you know, just written down some jokes to entertain, uh, you know, the passers-by. Uh, we have uh, riddles, uh, you know, what is full out of holes but still uh, holds water. And there, there is the, the answer, a sponge. Um, then we have uh, other kind of signs like uh, similar to the one, uh, the fence in Avondale. Uh, stay safe, stay home, you know, a repeater of the government motto. Um, or uh, this other one uh, that has uh, uh, some, uh, you know, some sort of communication uh, uh, to the, um, you know, it says greetings to all, uh, Waterview School students and families, and then there is some uh, writing in Mari, uh, that is also be welcome everybody, uh, we love you. Uh, you know, amazing, you are all amazing people. Aroha, which is married for love. Uh, and, uh, you know, on, on the sidewalks, uh, we see that uh, children have uh, been encouraged to, uh, you 
know, contribute to, to this uh, discourse. Um, in, in other parts of the neighbors, you'll see, find more uh, poppies. Um, so, um, yeah, basically that's, uh, that's um, my contribution to this seminar, uh, to this webinar, uh, is to um, show some attempt to uh, build up uh, a community uh, using uh, the public space. Thank you very much, Manfredo. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. If you can stop sharing your screen. In the okay. meantime, I will move uh, to the next speaker, which is the last speaker of the day, and uh, uh, he's teaching aesthetics uh, in Nanjing. Uh, at the moment, we've heard that uh, he's in Siena, stuck there, and possibly not really particularly problematically uh, uh, keep go, keep uh, teaching uh, in China, except for probably the timing. So, without further ado, Andrea, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. We cannot hear you, Andrea. Unmute my audio. Now I think you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. And, so, and here is also, uh, hope you can see my presentation. So th thanks to everybody for inviting me. It's always uh, super nice and super, so very interesting. Uh, I'm very much interested in questions about public space, in particular about the relationship with creativity. Actually, my research theme is about how creativity shapes and reshapes uh, our daily lives, and in particular public space. Just a biographical note, which is a biographical interlude, because in some senses it's, it's illuminate what I'm trying to say. So the people that are here with me, I've met them mostly, uh, even some of them today, but you know, virtually, but we're deeply connected in ways that uh, are surprising, uh, intertwined with material public space. I did my PhD in Philadelphia and actually wrote my dissertation on public art and everything started because the city of Philadelphia, as Jay was saying, offers all of these opportunities in public spaces. I spent most of my doctoral years in, at the Kimmel Center listening to the, to the orchestra. And with Manfredo, actually, we got a little thing in touch because our common and sheer interest in public space. And yeah, and I actually, uh, you know, Yena Young from the Plastic Fantastic is participating in our project, um, which is a digital and material exhibition that will take place in, uh, well, first on WeChat and then in different cities across the globe that is called Liu, which in Chinese means six and find the meaning, but even enough uh, for these, but you know, it's interesting to see how the digital space, again, I've never met many of these people uh, live, is, you know, extended, mediated uh, and reshaped to digital space. So my interest here is to talk about how Digital space and everyday creativity will merge or could merge in the in the future. So the idea is that what I usually talk about as a philosopher is something that has a reformative aspect into it. In the sense, I'm not interested in describing how the world is, but I'm interested in envisioning how the world should be, in order to make it well, supposedly a better place or a place where we would like to where we would like to live, uh, you know, more, and we could live actually more happily. Now, my reflection on uh, everyday creativity actually started uh, right after the, I mean, about the relationship between the pandemic and uh, everyday creativity, basically right after uh, the lockdown, because of course I saw uh, multiplied 
efforts to be creative, creative in ways that usually we're not. Uh, because while I think that as for public space, I think we were deprived of everyday creativity in public space way before we realized it. Public space was not accessible in the ways in which we're dreaming right now. Uh, I mean, there are endless cases of limitations of uses of public spaces. And some of the individuals that are the most persecuted across the globe are graffiti writers who do nothing more than expressing themselves creatively in public spaces. Now again, you might, be, you might agree or disagree on, about the fact that somebody paints a train. But if you think about the kind of uh, punishments and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, sentences that they get, you, you get a sense of how much they are, uh, you know, they are, how they are disproportionate. So one of the things I was interested in is to see, the, you know, this kind of multiplying of the use of many technologies in order to becoming and sharing creativity in the everyday. So one of the cases I talked about is uh, relates to this um, violinist who's actually a, a professional violinist player from the Rai Orchestra, Aldo Cicchini, who during a, a you know balcony performance was recorded by a Chinese neighbor because he lived in Milan, in Chinatown, in the Chinatown of Milan. This woman shared in a Weibo, which is basically the, you know, the Twitter or Facebook of, uh, of China, and it became viral. Now, this actually unleashed creativity because people didn't actually stop listen, you know, in listening to the piece that Chikini was playing. Basically, they also added their own performances. Through the use of technology, they embedded the videos and they produce a, basically um, an ever-growing artwork that, again, has this capacity of mixing, as I want to say in this last part, in this last few minutes, mixing the digital and the material. And I think that the future of cultural production has to be in between the virtual and the material space. We have had these ways of understanding digital space, virtual space, especially in terms of cultural production as, as a surrogate space, as something you get if you don't get the real thing. It's, it's something that it's, you know, it's either, uh, you know, the virtual experience of the Louvre, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the photo collections of the uh, History Museum in Athens or a video game. Now, for different reasons, I think that there are terrible limitations to all of these experiences. There are experiences that need not be meaningless, but they are not suitable for cultural production, uh, at least in a diverse way that could serve the needs and the desires and the interests of most of us. So what I'm interested in is how actually the virtual can have an effect on the material space and vice versa, in the sense of that what we have to envision, what we have to look for are possibilities of having digital production that then has a material effect and the other way around. Now here you see the example of Neo that actually is capable of interacting in the real space and the material space, but that's you know just a, a, a reference to popular culture piece. And here is one of the you know examples. This is Soko 19 work by Bianco Shock and Roland. So Bianco Shock is actually is a public artist. He's in the in the circuit of urban art, and he has created this piece that, that is largely. Um, I mean, that is, is, is virtual in the sense that uh, it actually is, is a website. What you do is you take a selfie, as you can see, you write something, and what you have written enters into the code that produces your image, and it basically reframes um, and it modifies the, the picture in ways where you see that where you are, what you write, gets you know, transferred in the material space, it's seen by somebody else. And also, can, well, the idea is that we're going to, is going to part also of our um, exhibition, is going to transform it into a book. That is one of the possibilities, which I find fascinating because one, if, if I can you know, close with one slogan or motto, is that we have to stop thinking about the digital space as, you know, separated from the material space. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Thank you very much, Andrea and uh, Hendrik. Uh, over yeah. to you. I see that you only have 11 oh, oh, minutes. Oh, sorry, sorry. I gotta stop sharing. You know, I like the. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so usually we would uh, now uh, go to those questions that we prepared before, but I believe that uh, actually you all already uh, uh, reacted to those. So I would say, uh, because we want to um, end the session uh, after one and a half hour, because everyone I think is so much on Zoom at the moment that uh, probably we want to keep it uh, concise. Um, therefore, I would say we give the word to uh, questions from uh, the attendees, from the audience. And I asked uh, Ingfen to already uh, uh, select uh, one or two, and maybe you can come up with the first question and then whoever of you um, want to answer can, can go for it. Okay. Yeah, for yeah. all your presentation, and that's very good. And I just feel, um, open my eye to lots of things today. And so I try to uh, combine multiple questions as one. And the first one I think I would like to ask about, uh, because today we talked about this kind of a virtual, uh, virtual performance and this kind of thing. And I'm wondering about, do you have any predictions about maybe after COVID-19, we still will have much more of this kind of performance online. And under this kind of situation, the, uh, the attendee question, uh, wondering about how could, because today we talk a lot about the, how different artists, they working online and they bring lots of things uh, on the internet. But um, we are wondering about how could audiences, they resituate themselves to this kind of a new uh, platform of the performance. And also because we still talking about the public space is a, uh, public space still matter um for it has its meaning and its function for the society so how could we combine this kind of a virtual reality to bring the public space to maybe to a home or bring people individual back to the public space through art and i think maybe we I, uh, me myself and attendees want to hear your answer about this thank you and maybe you can answer relatively short that all of you can maybe give a very short uh, feedback to it yeah mm -hmm. i'm happy to go shall i yeah yes well of course a huge huge question but i i, I want uh probably he elaborate on something that we discussed uh, with franco and and, and kirsten uh, around uh, this particular problem of the audience uh, that you mentioned uh, in your question and the point there is a point which is quite tricky so if you look at how these messages are actually valid in terms of uh, the capacity to produce an argument, then all of a sudden you realize that we have a, an incredible communication paradox. So all of a sudden we, li we, li we look at something that seems to be open, opening up a space for interaction, and you see that on one hand is a complete aphasia, so impossibility to speak. And what you see is just a replica of something which is a, you know, a sort of common sense thing, stay home, right? Uh, and, and then poppy and so on. On the other hand, uh, when you look at how this thing, uh, this form of message is actually opening up an interaction, you will find out that these are uh, hanging on uh, high fences that actually create a complete disconnect between uh, the two sides, so the street side, the public space, and the private space. So that's the point that I think is quite interesting in terms of, in terms of uh, what the COVID-19, uh, in a way, opens up as a moment of reflection of what we do and how we address that particular question of the audience. Other answers? Yeah, yeah Jay. Jay. Um, <laughs> thank you all. I'm, I'm, my head is so full. Uh, and so exciting, Andrea, that you spent time in Philadelphia. Uh, that's so great. I, when I'm thinking about the audiences and technology, I think, I think what's happening right now, here's my prediction, I think that was a question, is that audiences are more literate about the relationship of technology and public space uh, than they've ever been. That, that you and I together here are having a conversation across the world and we have an understanding of what that affords us, the opportunities there. But what it also does is it also helps us understand what it doesn't give us and what we're missing when we're not able to be in the room together. And I think that that in terms of audience and arts and performance has been missing. 
that people often think, well, maybe I could just listen to the album and not go to the concert because they haven't quite been literate enough to understand for themselves what the concert experience in person gives them, which is different from listening to the music at home on a recording because we haven't really thought about that. And suddenly what this virus is giving us is time and space <laughs> to, to understand for ourselves what we need. And I think I'm learning that in my life. There are some people I need to call on the phone and not Zoom. And there are some people that I need to see in person. And then there are some artists that I can enjoy the photographs online, but there are some that I'm deeply missing being in the room with to hear them sing or to see their um, sculpture in person. And I'm coming literate for myself about what my needs are. And I think what we're gonna find with audiences are after this epidemic is people are gonna start heading towards things that provide them emotional sustenance and, and, and abilities to deal with uh, how they wanna express themselves, how they process trauma and grief and how they experience love. And so they're gonna go towards those medium that, uh, that help them with that. So Andrea's question around how the virtual world and the physical world are kind of re redefining themselves, how we can understand the virtual as being a physical place is happening now because we are becoming more literate and understanding of our needs. And I think the arts are gonna to respond to that immediately. That's, that's my prediction. Mm, I think, um... Uh, there was a there was a journalist actually who had to write about our work without being uh, in our installation, and he had to only imagine from the videos and uh, photos, and then um, somehow he could feel it. He said uh, from the visual he could uh, somehow grow the senses, and maybe this kind of situation was already there before the virus as well. That um, as you say uh, said Jay that you can go to the concert or you can listen to the CD or either way um, it's a way how you experience a certain uh, art or um, installation. That, so what I think, maybe nothing has changed. Maybe it is uh, yeah, still the same. In the future will be we grow the senses that uh, with only one image you can uh, feel everything. Okay. Andrea, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I have a very general point. Well, it's always very difficult to, you know, predict the, the future and philosophers are particularly bad at that. So I'm not going to do that. In, but I think that there are uh, aspects that we have to keep in mind if we want to actually reimagine a work. So one of the things I think is, is crucial for renegotiating the relationship between the digital and the physical and to produce a new world of cultural production in a post-pandemic world is to displace the hierarchy between the center and the periphery. We're used to have to go everybody to the same place. You want to go and see something cool in East Coast? You got to go to New York. Philly is better, but, you know, like, um, or, um, you know, like in, in China, you have to go to Shanghai or and so forth. In, in, in Italy, you have to go to Milan. We, one of the things that we should learn, hopefully, is to displace the hierarchy and to restart to actually cultivate, uh, you know, basically the periphery. Now, what the digital, you know, space can do is that actually can make the periphery international in the sense that it can counteract the real problem of living in a non um, you know multicultural space because you know people don't live there you know people from different countries don't live there or you know intellectuals and so forth and so on but these actually can help this uh, and so one of the things that i will ask for uh, from artists and from cultural producers is to stop favoring the same you know cookie cutter places in order to go and explore the possibilities. Have information travel and material installation be made locally in the way in which actually, you know, I can say nothing more beautiful about, you know, because I love everything they do, but that's exactly what she was talking about with the project at the Biennale where only the information travel and the materialization was created wherever this thing was. It could be, you know, in a village in the middle of nowhere. 
Okay, I would say uh, time is uh, up for, uh, unfortunately, no more time for more answers to the questions, but um, for the audience, you can send also in the post event uh, surveys and more questions, and we will try to take some of those questions in uh, further sessions. I just want to uh, share with you uh, again um, our event, um, basically, uh, next Thursday. So you can check on our website, uh, the Journal of Public Space. Uh, <clears throat> there will be this event on health disparity and public space in high density environments. So I think we try, uh, as you will see, uh, to, to mix a little bit the, the need on one hand to, to think about the positive and to create a, a, a creative and, and human environment. And on the other hand, of course, also address uh, the, the kind of deep uh, social issues that, that are uh, related to this crisis. So the next uh, session will be uh, more basically looking at um, the kind of uh, big problems that, that exist, uh, that were basically always existing, but now basically with the virus become even more pronounced. Um, and we will have a very, uh, interesting speakers, we believe. Uh, so we have uh, Mindy uh, Fulilov from um, New School in New York. She's a renowned author who has, uh, as a psychiatrist, has written extensively on uh, uh, mental health problems, for example, in neighborhoods that were uh, gentrified or, or uh, were through urban renewal destroyed and people had to move out. Um, and uh, now is also reflecting about uh, the crisis as a pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, Miodrag Mitrasinovic uh, as an urbanist, uh, also from the same school. Then we have uh, a lady Tripta Chandola of Action Aid, uh, a group that it works in um, daily in uh, informal settlements uh, on the front line um, with people that are now experiencing uh, the pandemic. And then uh, Dr. Fan Ning, uh, also uh, uh, who is a, a surgeon, um, as also a medical professional, but also uh, chair of an NGO, which is called uh, Health in Action, uh, working uh, with people in subdivided flats in Hong Kong under this, uh, these circumstances. And uh, uh, another urbanist who before worked uh, a long time with UNICEF and now with Isocarp, uh, Jens Ertz, to um, reflect and comment uh, on the other presentation. So this will be the session next Thursday. So I hope this will be a kind of rich program that, that we are intending in those uh, webinars. We really have um, always in between those sessions on creative approaches, but also the kind of more difficult um, situation. Um, also, uh, you might have seen the attendees, uh, there is a link that was shared um, where you can see the video of our last uh, uh, webinar, which also had uh, a number of interesting speakers from different parts of the world, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and I'm also uh, asked to remind you, if you uh, go to the video channel, you can also uh, subscribe to this channel because then you would also get uh, further information about events. So this is all from my side. Luisa, you have still something? If not, uh, yes, uh, I would like just to say a few words regarding um, uh, recordings. Every, every webinar is recorded and we are now preparing uh, um, um, all these videos from each uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we will publish all these videos and we already published the first one from the last uh, webinar. Um, on YouTube, uh, we will use uh, the channel of City Space Architecture. So you go on YouTube and you look for our channel, City Space Architecture, and you can already find the first one. And we will publish then the second uh, um, video on the same uh, playlist under the name of this initiative. So we encourage you to subscribe to our channel so that you get a notification anytime we publish um, 
a video. But we will announce also through our social media and through our mailing list. Uh, if you didn't already, please su subscribe also to our mailing list to receive all updates and invitations regarding future webinars and our initiative. Thank you. Thank you to all uh, speakers and to uh, the team. And uh, thank you very much uh, for listening uh, from the audience uh, attendees. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you.